Shabbat Shalom, everybody. We hope everybody's having a wonderful Shabbat today. So we're going into signs to identify the tribes. And uh, it's going to be an in-part lesson. So we decided to break it up to give you more information and to go more detail-based scripturally. So um, without further ado, all right, Katha? Shalom, brothers and sisters. In the last lesson, we touched on the agenda of the nations and how the tribes split and what tribes remained in the kingdom of Judah and what tribes went with the kingdom of Israel. In this lesson, we're going to continue learning the history of the children of Israel. And we're also going to look at the characteristics of the Jews to know what they look like according to scripture. Hopefully this is enjoyable and good for edification for all. We apologize for the delay in the visuals, but hopefully you all can hear us clearly and get edification through the scriptures. And if you like the PDF notes to the lesson, please visit the website at hebrewreaders.com and go to the website tab, Doctrine Video Notes, and find the thumbnail and you'll find a PDF tab right next to it. Now we're going to continue to see what transpired after the Babylonian captivity as pertaining to the kingdom of Judah and the inhabitants that remained among them as we went go into the Persian captivity. Remember also there was a remnant of the 10 tribes that remained in the land of Assyria and the Medes as well. Okay, so you can get a view of what the Bible had showed happened. Now jump into the Persian Empire. By that time, the inhabitants of the kingdom of Judah started spreading through the four corners of the earth into the Middle East and Africa. Can you please read uh, Esther chapter 8, verse 9, please? Yes, indeed. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month Sivan, on the three and twentieth day thereof. And it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews and to the lieutenants, and the deputies and rulers of the provinces which are from India unto Ethiopia, a hundred twenty and seven provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing and according to their language. So there you see, if you take the time to go look at the Persian Empire, those hundred and twenty provinces went from India, and this is all inhabiting the land of Shem coming all the way, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan. It brings you to Iran, then to Turkey and Arabia and the land of Israel and Jordan and all that. And then it brings you over to Ethiopia, which that brings you to Egypt, all the way down to Sudan, mm -hmm. Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, uh, Djibouti. So you can see how that encompassed the Persian Empire. And you could find inhabitants of the southern kingdom. And remember, that remnant of the ten tribes that stayed in uh, Assyria and Nineveh, now they're all being referred to as Jews. You can find them there. And notice they still spoke Hebrew, and they still wrote Hebrew at that time because the letters that were sent out had to also be written in the Jews' language so that the Jews could understand as well. All right? This is so you can see how things start to change and the inhabitants of the kingdom of Judah started to spread abroad into the lands of the allotments of the sons of Noah in the four corners of the earth. We're following the tribes going through the four beasts of Daniel. So you had the Babylonians, you know, you had the, the Medes and Persians, and now we're going into the Grecians to see what was going on with the Israelites, where were they, and what were they described as even in those times. The Grecians, you can read the book of Maccabees. That's essentially a book that discusses what transpired during the Grecian Empire. We had actually touched on it a bit, how they were trying to enslave us all and get us out of the land. You have Antiochus specifically, who was, was the wicked root that sought to destroy the whole nation that was left there in Jerusalem. So that was the Greek Empire. And then we're going to jump forward to the Roman Empire. And by the time of the Roman Empire, the Israelites, the inhabitants of the kingdom of Judah had spread further into the four corners of the earth. You're going to find that they started moving into North Africa mm -hmm. and into Europe and into the islands of the Mediterranean Sea. 
by the time of the apostles. So you see how the inhabitants of Judah continue to spread. Wow, remember those 10 tribes, they're off in a region of Osiris still, the majority of them. Right. Thank you, Zach. Wow. Can you read Acts chapter 2, verse 5? Acts chapter 2, verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. That verse lets you know the Jews had already spread among all the nations in the uh, allotments of the sons of Noah. Okay. And jump to verse 5 through, uh, I mean, 8 eight. through 11. Yeah. Acts chapter 2, verse 8. And how hear we every man in our, in our own tongue? When we were born, Parthians, and Medes, and Elamites, and the dwellers of Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and in Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Pergia, and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and, and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of Elohim. So there we see how the inhabitants of the southern kingdom had spread. You can find them everywhere, just about in the allotment of the sons of Noah. Uh, touching back on those places, the Parthians, the Medes and Elamites. This is the region of like Iran today, Iran going into Afghanistan. The dwellers of Mesopotamia, that's Syria in between the Euphrates and Tigris River. So that's parts of North Iraq and also like going into Armenia and whatnot. In parts of East Turkey, and then he said, and in Judea, well, Judea is Judea, and Cappadocia and Pontus. Cappadocia is in the land of Turkey, as we know it today. Pontus and Asia. So you can see they had started being in Asia. They started getting closer over to the uh, lands of Japheth. In Europe and Asia. Phrygia, that's in Turkey, and Pamphylia. You have Egypt, which is in Africa. And remember, they had already been in Africa because during the Persian Empire, you can find them all the way up to Ethiopia, right? And as Zach Wild mentioned, how tracking them through the different kingdoms of the beast, and it's good that you mentioned it, Zach Wild, because we remember, what is it, uh, Third Maccabees that talks about how the Israelites were in Egypt? Right. They were living yeah. in Alexandria. Yep. And uh, Ptolemy was trying, he got mad at them. And he tried to kill them all, but then Ahayah delivered them. So... You can see how uh, that was a good reference for touching on the Grecian Empire. You can find the Israelites in Egypt as well. They were staying predominantly Alexandria. Okay. And then I mentioned how they started to spread further into the allotment of the sons of Noah. By the time of the book of Acts, not only do you find them in Egypt now, now they've gone further west. Now you find them in North Africa, which in the Bible is known as Libya. Right. about Cyrene, which was uh, the ancient Carthage. So you can see how the Israelites, they kept spreading. And uh, they also started spreading into Europe. Find them in Rome, which is Italy. And uh, they went into Crete. Crete is, that's the island of the Mediterranean Sea. So you can see how they started transitioning into the islands. You had the Cretes and Arabians. So we, you see the Israelites started moving down into Arabia as well. So that helps see how by the time of the Roman Empire, you can see how the Israelites had started spreading further. They started spreading further into the uh, allotments of the sons of Noah. Particularly further into Europe, Asia, and further into Africa. Not into the region of Arsereth yet, because it's the ten tribes over there in the region of Arsereth, not the inhabitants of the southern kingdom. Okay? Now, still in the Roman Empire, the inhabitants of the kingdom of Judah were spread further into the ends of the earth during the siege of Jerusalem, especially further into the land of Ham, where they were known to flee in persecution. And that took them beyond North Africa, eventually into sub-Saharan Africa. But mentioning how that's where the Israelites were known to flee when in trouble, you have Babylonian captivity. You remember Zachua with Jeremiah, the soon as the king of Babylon come, the Israelites, their first plan is to run into Egypt, right. to go back over there. Then Joseph, when they want to kill Yahshua, the angel told him, go to Egypt. Right. <laughs> so you see that the Israelites know, when in doubt, <laughs> flee to Egypt. <laughs> so you can see how running into Africa is a thing the Israelites do. Now looking at Luke chapter 21, verse 20 and 24, this was in the Roman Empire. This was a prophecy of what would take place in 70 AD uh, under Titus and Vespasian. If you don't mind reading that, please, Luke 21, 20 to 24. 
Looked up the oh, 20 to 21 and 23 to 24. Sorry. I got it, man. Thanks. My bad. My bad. <laughs> Luke chapter 21, verse 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, that prophecy showed that when that came to pass, that 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem is no longer the Israelites that are in the land. Right. The Gentiles, they finally got their foothold on the land to get us out of there. And I have foretold, Yache said, we'll be led away captive into all nations. So that prophecy didn't just stop right then and there in 70 AD because they had to get us carried off into all nations. The southern kingdom had to be delivered into the hands of all nations. So there you see that process started. The inhabitants of Judah are no longer the inhabitants of the land of Judah nor the land of Israel. It's all the Gentiles dwelling in the land until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So the Gentiles are going to continue to be in the land up until the coming of that great one, Yache. Now, this was a persecution from Rome. This was an attack on the Israelites to get rid of us. This caused us to have to flee further and further away from the inhabited areas of the world. When you look at maps of what was called the known world, where people live, especially they started making those maps in the Greek Empire. You had the maps of Herodotus and Strabo, for example. When they do their map making, they did not include sub-Saharan Africa as a part of the known world. Their maps always cut off at Libya and down to Ethiopia. Right. And that was because sub-Saharan Africa was a wilderness. It was not a place where people lived and it was counted as a place of civilization, I should say. It's interesting because we've seen that the Israelites had already made it to North Africa. We've seen they were in Egypt and we know they were in Ethiopia as well, even from the days of the Persian Empire. The scriptures also help show that the Israelites were the ones who would end up going beyond the rivers of Ethiopia into sub-Saharan Africa and continuing to track. They're still in the Roman Empire because Rome is the one that still has dominion now, specifically Edom, who is ruling here in the end of this world. In this time, the inhabitants of the southern kingdom fled into the area known today as sub-Saharan Africa. And they are the people known as the Bantus. And we're going to look at the scriptures to see how I had showed that they would go and they would be found in these places. And from these places, they would eventually be sold captive into all nations, as Yache foretold in Luke chapter 21, verse 24. Can we go to Isaiah chapter 18, verse 1 and 2, please? Isaiah chapter 18, verse 1. Woe to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, that sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters, saying, Go ye swift messengers to a nation scattered and peeled, to a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden down, whose land the rivers have spoiled. Now, what was said here is interesting. He said, whose land the rivers have spoiled. Revelations, what is that called? Revelations 17 and 15 says the waters are nations, peoples, and tongues. Right. And Luke chapter 21, verse 24 said, the land shall be trodden of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Right. So it lets you know the Israelites are not the ones that inhabit in the land of Israel today. Now, touching back to verse 18 and 1 of Isaiah. So this is a land beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. The rivers of Ethiopia, scripturally, are referencing the rivers that we can find in Africa today. And when you follow those rivers, it actually takes you along the route to see how the Israelites got to that land beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, which is known today as Sub-Saharan Africa. You can see the journey if you start going down the Nile River. That takes you from Egypt down into Sudan, 
down towards Ethiopia. That leads you to the Lake Victoria. Now, when you get to Lake Victoria, you're in sub-Saharan Africa already. Then you can see how they went from Lake Victoria over to the west through the Congo River, which takes you straight to West Africa via the Niger River or the Niger River, where the Israelites can be found to this day, the Bantus. And then if you also go back to Lake Victoria and see how they ended up in um, the southern region of sub-Saharan Africa, you can go from Lake Victoria down to Lake Tanganyika. I hope I pronounced that right. And that leads you to the Zambezi River, which is down there by Zambia. It brings you in that region. And it also leads you down to South Africa. So it's interesting how just following the rivers, you can find the areas where the, the Bantus, the inhabitants of the kingdom of Judah, had actually went and can still be found because they are that nation, as Isaiah chapter 18, verse 2 mentioned, that nation that had been scattered and peeled. We've been destroyed. And a people terrible from the beginning, a nation meted out and trodden down. We would be in a bad case by the time we got there. And if you look at the history, we were already pretty bad in idolatry. And we did get trodden and um, meted out and scattered when the time of colonization came. They knew who they were coming for. And there was no confusion about it when they came. All right. I want to also add the inhabitants of the kingdom of Judah. You can find them throughout the regions of the known world or the allotments of the sons of Noah, which is Africa, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East and the Mediterranean. As we've seen through the scriptures, you can find them in those areas. And we see also in the scriptures how they even spread further into the land of Ham, into sub-Saharan Africa. That was all during the time of the Roman Empire. While the 10 tribes, you had some remnant of them among the inhabitants of Judah. Some stayed up in Assyria and the Medes area, but predominantly the 10 tribes were in the region of Osiris. Now That brings us closer to our time to see where the kingdom of Judah was as opposed to the kingdom of Israel. Okay. Now, continuing from there, we see where the inhabitants of Judah have been spread by the time of the Roman Empire. Now, in Revelation 17 and 10, it tells that there was another kingdom to come after the Roman Empire, where it says in Revelation 17 and 10, And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is. The one that is, is Rome. They were ruling during the time of John's revelation. The five that were fallen was the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, and the Grecians. We've seen that the Israelites have been enslaved in each one of those empires. And now the one that is, which was Rome at that time, we've seen the Israelites were destroyed in Judea and sent out. And they had to flee out, fleeing from persecution. It goes on to say in Revelation 17 and 10. And the other is not yet come, because John was in the time of the Romans. So the other that was not yet come is speaking of the Holy Roman Empire that was to come after the Roman Empire. And it goes on to say, And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Going into the Holy Roman Empire brings us up to the time of the slave trade. Because it was during the Holy Roman Empire when the Ishmaelites, who were part of the confederacy of Psalms 83 to cut Israel off from being a nation, forwarded the effort by starting the Arab slave trade when they started selling the children of Israel to the east. And then after them, during the same Holy Roman Empire, the Ten Horns with the transatlantic slave trade, wherein Spain, Portugal, Great Britain, and other countries of the Ten Horns came, like France and Netherlands. They all came to the regions of Osirath, where the Ten Tribes were, and beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, where the inhabitants of Judah were, along with forcing out the inhabitants of Judah that were in Europe, down into Africa, and on slave ships into the Americas with the other inhabitants of Judah out of sub-Saharan Africa, all in an effort to scatter the tribes among all people from one 
end of the earth, even unto the other, as Ahiah said he would do, in the curses of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verse 64. And they did so with ships, as Ahiah said he would bring Israel into Egypt, which is bondage, again with ships. And these nations fulfilled what Ahiah said he would do. So you have a history. You can condense it by just going by the scriptures, but there's a plethora of history on how that slave trade come about where inhabitants of the southern kingdom were enslaved. Now, the inhabitants of the southern kingdom have been being enslaved by many nations. As we've seen throughout the scriptures, we've been in slavery for a long time. We went in slavery in Egypt. Then we got enslaved by the Assyrians, then got enslaved by the Babylonians, then by the Grecians, then by the Romans, the Philistines and the Tyrians, the Canaanites were helping enslave us. When they say we're known as the slaves, it's throughout the scriptures where that happens to us all the time. And so tentatively, that's an overview of where the Israelites ended up at and how they ended up being spread all over the world through the slave trade. Okay. This is where it gets interesting to talk about the characteristics of the Hebrews, physical characteristics, that is. It was not uncommon for nations to refer to us as other nations that we are not based upon how we look. The concept of somebody being black means they're Hebrew is something that can cause a real stumbling block because there are multiple nations that are people of color, not just the Hebrews. For example, the original Arabs, they were people of color. The original children of Ishmael, they were people of color. The children of Ham, their names, the specifically Ham, their names and also their graven images, like the images on the walls of the Egyptians and whatnot, show that they were people of color as well. And also, we're going to look at the scriptures to see too, even we, the Israelites, knowing that we favor in features and whatnot, when it was needed, we could act like we were from another nation to be able to get out of a jam. <laughs> so let's look at that. And then more than anything, they would mistake us for the children of Ham because the children of Ham were people of color too. Right. Um, Let's look at, uh, can you read Testament of Judah, chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, please? We're going to see what Judah and Dan did when they had gotten a bind, and they were trying to make sure they didn't get caught. All right, go ahead, please. Uh, Testament of Judah, chapter 7, verse 1. And the next day it was told us that the king of the city of Gash, with a mighty host, was coming against us. I, therefore, and Dan feigned ourselves to be Amorites, and as allies went into their city. So you see, they got somebody coming, they came with a big army, so they started acting like they Amorites. <laughs> and there's no way, if they weren't people of color, that they could just fake that they were children of Ham. Right. Because the Amorites are Canaanites for brothers and sisters who may be new to it. Right. right? So you can see how when needed, they could play the role. Because we had similar features. Now, that similarity, if we acted a certain way or probably dressed a certain way, one could mistake us for the children of Ham. You see, Judah and Dan, they did it to evade, attack the enemy. Now, that still was consistent when we look in the Exodus, in the days when the Israelites had moved into Egypt. Exodus chapter 2, verse 17 to 19, please. Exodus chapter 2, verse 17. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. Because these were daughters of Midian uh, that had came to water their flocks and the people wanted to help them, but Moses helped them. All right, continue. And when they came to Raul, their father, he said, How is it that ye are come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. See, they didn't know he wasn't actually an Egyptian. And it's interesting because, Zachua, you remember from the book of Joshua where Moses had just came from. He, he just, just came, came from, from the land of Ethiopia. Right, he just came from Cush. Right. Oh, they gave him a whole bunch of stuff to leave with. You know, he, he came there lacking nothing. And they think he's an Egyptian. You know, when I went to Uganda, they were telling me that I look like I'm Nigerian, I guess because of my color. Mm. And of course, in Egypt, they tell me I look like an Egyptian. So it's like <laughs> you can see how they get it. And it's interesting right. that they thought you were a Nigerian in Uganda because those were Bantus. Right. They knew you were not Egyptian. Right. 
they can tell the features from where people are at as opposed to being in Egypt where they're not the same people so they <laughs> they, they can't tell the difference too much <laughs> real interested now continuing right we see how they were mistaking us for Egyptians notice it was the Gentiles that were mistaken us for Egyptians or children of Ham and Zakwa just mentioned how <laughs> being a rung in Egypt where the Gentiles are right. they would think he's Egyptian right. <laughs> but what among the Bantus <laughs> they think he's from Nigeria because right. they know full well you come from the same right. people they see my they see the features and then they see the color. The feature is like, oh, you my people, and then the color is like, you're from Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> and Nigeria, they call you a red Igbo. Right. <laughs> now, it's interesting because the children of Ham are people of color, just like the Hebrews. So it's easy to mistake us for them, just like Moses was mistaken for an Egyptian. And also we've seen Judah and Dan feigning themselves to be Amorites. Let's look at this, uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse 6, please. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Put, and Canaan. All these people are people of color. You, have, you still have the Egyptians today. As we mentioned, you can look on their walls and see what their color was. Even though they tried to change a lot of the images, a lot of them are still accurate as to the people of color. And also, you literally can go look at the real Egyptians. You can find them in Aswan, in Luxor, in Upper Egypt. Yeah. And also, you have, they have a certain color to no, them. No, no. But, right, right. Because you can find them over in Alexandria too. <laughs> we haven't been with spread them. Spread out. Right. They're called Saidi in uh, Egypt. Right. Now, you also have the dark Egyptians, the Nubians. And we met some of them as well. It's a nice dark color, but their hair texture is like it throws you off. It's like, oh, look at his. They got like a wavy pattern. Right, right. I remember when we seen that first guy in uh, that city, and we were looking at him like, whoa. And he was looking at us like, oh, you got you dark too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we knew it wasn't our people, though. You could right, see you right. You know the difference. Right. right. So you have the Egyptians, still people of color, the Ethiopians, which are the children of Cush. There's a scripture that says, can an Ethiopian change his skin? They've maintained their color. Today, the, the darkest people in the world are the Nilots, the Nilotic people of Sudan. These are the children of Cush. Uh, the land of Cush is Sudan, Ethiopia, Eritrea, um, Somalia, and uh, Djibouti. So you have the Nilots, they're one color, one pure, straight, flush color. It doesn't change. And then you have the other Ethiopians, like the ones that live in Ethiopia, literally, they're that more fair color and they're consistent in that color. And then you have the other ones in Somalia where they are, they're a little darker, but they're not as dark as the Nilots, nor as light as the ones in Ethiopia, and they're one consistent color. The children, of course, are interesting. Their color does not change. Their skin stays. It's pretty consistent with them. How much sunlight they're in. Right. (laughs) They stay that one color. So so you can see how they stay the same. Now, the children of Put, you can find some of the original children of Put are people of the tribe called Fulani in Nigeria, for example. If you have the opportunity to Google Fulani people, you can get to see what the children of Put look like. I mean, you can do comparisons and see how they look similar to the Egyptians. Um, what's the girl's name? Um, the actress? Kerry Washington. Kerry I think Washington. It was. Yes, she's um, she's a Puttite. Once you see the features of the Puttites, you can look at her and you'll you you'll be like, wow. Like, right. Who also Obama? Obama is from the children of Kush, so you can help understand how not. Every quote unquote black person is a Hebrew. If you look at the history, I think Obama's tribe was the Lao tribe, either Lao or Nikita, both of which are Kushite tribes. So you can see that just because somebody's a person of color doesn't make them a Hebrew. Now, this was interesting. The word Ham, the father of Mizraim, Kush, Put, and Canaan, he obviously was also a man of color. And the word Ham in Hebrew is Kum, it means to be hot. Also, you have in the Hebrew definition in H2345, it shows the word means to be warm. That is by implication sunburnt or swarthy, blackish, brown. So through the Hebrew language, we can see that indeed Ham was black, brown color, and his children 
are the same to this day. Interestingly, in the Egyptian language, the word Kim, I don't know how they say it specifically, but Kim, it means to be black. And they say the land of Egypt, the Egyptians used to call it Kemet or Kemut or Kamut. And that meant land of blacks or nation of blacks. So you can see how through their language, you can see that Ham also meant black and the nation of the Hamites. These are people of color, according to the scriptures. Even Kush, we talked about the Ethiopians. Kush, you can look at the definition for Kush is uh, H3568, and that word in the uh, Browns Briggs definition is literally black. So these people are a people of color. It was Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23, that said, can an Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Which was showing that Ethiopians, their skin is consistent. It's going to stay. Notice in the Bible referred to the children of Cush as Cush originally in Genesis chapter 10, verse 6. They became known as Ethiopians from the Greek language. The Greek word Ethiop, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, is a G128, which means to scorch the face, an Ethiopian as a blackamoor. Okay, so you can see how you know, the Ethiopians were indeed people of color, and the children of Ham were people of color. So when you see in the scriptures they're mistaking us for Egyptians and whatnot, we're feigning ourselves to be Canaanites, it's because we are people of color too, <laughs> from the scriptures unto this day. You can see how. It didn't change in the New Testament with Paul. They mistook him for an Egyptian because the Israelites were still people of color. We're going to touch that. That was. A, can you read that, please? Acts, yeah, Acts chapter 21, verse 37 and 38, please. Yeah. Acts chapter 21, verse 37. And as Paul was led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canest thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian? which before these days made us an uproar and led it out into the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers. You see how he just looking at me like, aren't you an Egyptian? But what does Paul tell him? But Paul said, I am a man, which I'm a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Sicilia, a citizen of no mean city. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. So you see how... Even in the days of the New Testament, they were still mistaking us for the children of Ham. So that can kind of help understand why, sadly, there are concepts, you know, like Egyptology, where they tell us we come from Egypt and we're the ancient Egyptians and things of that nature. But that's not true. We, we did live in Egypt for a time. The Exodus story, interestingly enough, the Bible is the only record that gives an accurate account of how we got from Egypt to the Americas. <laughs> so we can know who we are. Touching back on the, the thing that just because someone is a person of color does not mean they're an Israelite because there are other nations that are people of color. We touched on the children of Ham. Also, the other children of Abraham were originally people of color too. You have Abraham had his first son with Hagar, the Egyptian. as two people of color, as Abraham came from the Chaldeans. They had Ishmael. He was a man of color. And then Abraham's third wife, Keturah. And she was also a person of color because she was a Canaanite. She had six sons, which are known as the children of the East, or the sons of Keturah, and also known as the Arabs. When you look at Jubilees, chapter 20, verse 11 and 12, it talks about the sons of Ishmael, and the sons of Keturah went off into an east country away from Isaac, and they became known as Arabs and Ishmaelites. The Arabs are also people of color originally, and they still are people of color today. If you have the opportunity to, you know, look into it, like the Bedouin people that usually, in Egypt anyway, they have a darker tone usually. You can tell the difference. And um, we can look in the Bible and see an Arab man to see that he was black too. Um, Job, the son of of the children of Keturah and son of Abraham. He was a Gentile, but he was a believer, so he was a brother. Can you read that, please? Job chapter 30, verse 30. My skin is black upon me, and my bones are burnt with heat. And that word black is in reference to skin color. It's not in reference to just mourning or being sad. It was literal. And Job, he's out in the sun too long, it's going to burn him, just like it happens to us. I get, if I, I, I change a little bit. I know I'm pretty dark already, but I change a little bit come summertime. Zakwa, he, he changes completely. He get golden. <laughs> 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 now, that interesting too, that leads to the next thing because 
yes, we're people of color, but we're not all dark. Right. Even from the scriptures, it shows we range in color and complexion. Can you read Songs of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5, please? Uh, Songs of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5. I am black, but comely. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Oh, that lets you know the church, she's dark skinned. Right. <laughs> she said, I'm black but comely. That's right. <laughs> As the tents of Kadar, Kadar, the tents of the Ishmaelites. That lets you know one of Ishmael's sons, he literally named him Kadar, which is another word for black. Right. <laughs> that lets you know the Ishmaelites are dark skinned people too. So she lets you know, I'm dark skinned, but I'm beautiful. So, verse 6. Then, all right. Look not upon me because I am black. Because the sun hath looked upon me. Notice she was out there. She was outside working hard, right? When we're out in the sun, we get darker. Hence, she darkened up. Yet, she's still comely, even as her complexion got darker. <laughs> I continue. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards. But mine own vineyard have I not kept. Now, we have dark skins. We also have people that are fair skinned, like Esther the Benjamite. Uh, can you read Esther chapter 15, verse 5, please? And she was ruddy through the perfection of her beauty. And her countenance was cheerful and very amenable. But her heart was in anguish for fear. Now notice, it's interesting today how when someone is of a fair complexion, they are viewed as to be more attractive. Mm -hmm. And you can see how for the Hebrews, though, <laughs> whether you're black, you can be comely. <laughs> Right. And then, if you fan ruddy, you can have a beautiful complexion too. It doesn't matter. Because <laughs> um, that, that's a world standard where they base beauty on your complexion, where uh, you created all this creation perfectly. Right. No matter what tone a person is, the Ahayas uh, work. And he made them according to his pleasure. You know, so that goes for all nations. We all belong to one Ahayah. Uh, now, you've seen also you have ones like David, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 42. Can you read that, please? And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And that word ruddy can refer to having red hair or referring to the skin color. So David wasn't a redhead. It was referring to his countenance, his complexion. He looked somewhere around the color of Zach Wall and whatnot. That's what we call, we call them red bones today. Right, he was fair skinned with a red complex. Right. Yeah, some along them lines there. So <laughs> just touching on the characteristics of the Hebrews, so you can see how they are people of color today and they range in color. It's interesting if you go get on the internet and look up like the aboriginals of the Pacific Islands, the Fiji Islands and whatnot, you're going to see some people with some complexions darker than Zach Wall. Right. Some even darker than me. But if you go look at the commercials of Hawaii, they're going to show you, you know, try to show people that more look like the rock and whatnot, so that real fair complexion to offset, to make it seem like the people there aren't really that dark. But they have a range of color. Yeah, I've been there. They're pretty dark. Man. Very dark people. But they all uh, they all live inside of the island. They live in the middle of the island. They push mm, them They all, keep them inland. They push all of them inland, so wow. you know, tourists can be on the outskirts, just like they did with Australia. So right, right. And then you come over to the Americas. You have a lot of the brothers from Issaquah and whatnot. You see them. They can range in complexion. We know what a quintessential, what we would call a Mexican today. And they range in complexion. You look at the videos and see the Aboriginal people there. I myself, I have been down to Motosincla, which is down there, Guatemala. And I saw some of my fellow Israelites there who are of a darker complexion than what we'll see on an average basis. You can find that in down in Panama. Uh, you know, it was a funny story, Zachua. Right. When I had the opportunity, I was gracious, I had the opportunity to play some professional basketball for the uh, national team in the FIBAs. Well, when we played against the country of Cuba, now mind you, I didn't know about, you know, who Israelites are, nor was I reading the Bible and things like that. I was living in the world. So we play against Cuba. And I see a bunch of people that look like me. <laughs> I'm like, wait, wait, wait. Those are Cubans? 
<laughs> I was like, what are they doing on that team? <laughs> Not realizing we really all over the world when we played against Puerto Rico and things like that, getting to see, like, we range in color. Yeah, it's sad how they're doing it, though, how the how society is, is trying to divide us, even in the sense of skin color. Because even in the example of Mexico, um, you know, a lot of the the brothers and sisters down there are fair skinned, but the ones that are darker skinned, they're, they're even categorizing them as a different label. Like they're, right. they would call them like Afro Mexican or something like right. that. Like, right. Like trying to divide the line between what's what's Mexican and making you seem like you're something different because of your skin tone being different, or being darker. It's, it's all a, it's all a gimmick. Right. Right. The Gentiles sadly do it amongst themselves too. The Indians, the Hindus, right. They have the caste system where if you have a darker color, it's hard to get married because they want to keep themselves looking a certain way. So, Sadly, that concept of judging people based on color is uh, it's a lack you know, of understanding. Yeah. yeah. So, even wherever the Israelites are, you can find them in different ranges. And, you know, even Israelites there today, some of them, you have to you have to talk to them and get to know their history. Unless you're real familiar, I have the grace to make you real familiar with features to be able to tell. Some people, you got to talk to them and get to know where they're actually from and get to learn about them, get to know their spirit and whatnot to really identify them. So with that, that's a nice stopping point. On the next one, we'll get into the curses and looking at how to identify the Israelites according to the signs. Because as we talked about, not everybody that's a person of color is an Israelite. And they're scattered all over the world. So we have to go by the signs that Ahaya gave to be able to identify them in the different areas that they're in. And now how you're willing, we get to get further into understanding how to find them after that lesson to look at how to identify them according to the spirit, to know which tribe they're from individually. Because not every person from America is a Judite. Right. That's a big misconception and it's a big stumbling block. There are many, many people here that are quote unquote called Negroes that are actually from another tribe. A lot of them are even Gadites. So there's a, there's a lot to look at when looking at the spirit, but that'll be after the next lesson. I have be gracious. We get to start to get into that, mm -hmm. to really identify the individual tribes by the spirit after we identify them by the signs and curses that I have spoke of in the book of Deuteronomy. Anything else, Zachwa? Uh, okay. Peace be unto you. Talam. Talam. <laughs>